And if everyone can just keep their phones on mute until we begin, um, it'll help reduce noise pollution. All right, everyone, good evening. It is 7.01 and I'd like to call the 7.01 of the Hartford Charter Revision Commission meeting on August 19th to order. And we will start with a roll call and I will pass it over to David Grant to call the roll. Okay, so when I call your name, just please say here and uh, be advised that if your phone is not on mute, I may have muted you. So you may have to unmute yourself. And again, that's just to reduce noise pollution for our viewers at home. Uh, so James Wolf. Here. John Gale. John Gale. Yeah, I'm here. Kate find the mute button. <laughs> Kathleen Kowalshin. Bruce Rubenstein. Here. Raul de Jesus. I see you, Raul. I'm here. Eon Smith. Vicky Gallon Clark. Here. Melvin Medina. Arunan Arulumpalum. Kamora Harrington. Kenneth Kennedy Jr. Here. Yadira Rivera. Steve Bonafonte. Here. Alexander Aponte. I think you may be missing one commissioner. Um, I think we're, we're one short of a quorum, yes. Um, so we can move on. Um, we'll skip the approval of the minutes um, until we get a quorum. Um, that was item three. And item number two on the agenda tonight was public comment. Uh, and I don't see any members of the public either. Uh, so... I guess that brings us to item number four on the agenda, um, which will be the budget panel discussion. So um, attorney Mednick was um, you know, instrumental in pulling together a start studded cast of subject matter experts for uh, round two of our discussion on budget issues this evening. Um, and this evening for panelists uh, who will provide their insights on their um, their experiences um, with budget issues uh, in the various municipalities that they have worked in uh, and at, in some instances at the state level. Um, I'm going to introduce each one of them and then we'll, um, we'll start with um, the, the panelists. Uh, so first we have uh, the Honorable Scott Jackson, who's the former mayor and current finance director for the town of Hamden. He was also the commissioner of the Department of Labor and Revenue Services at the state of Connecticut. We have the Honorable Paul Pernaruski, who is the president of the Waterbury Board of Aldermen and the former chair of the Waterbury Charter Revision Commission and a Connecticut Assistant Attorney General. Uh, we have Carl Goldfield, the former president and chair of the Finance Committee for the New Haven Board of Alders. And then last but not least, we have Michael Pollard, who is the chief of staff to the mayor of Stamford and the former chair of the Stamford Board of Finance. So I think what we'll do is we'll start off with, um, with Mayor Jackson, and then we'll go through each um, subsequent panelist, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. All right, so Mayor Jackson, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. 
Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, there are a number of tropes uh, regarding the creation of budgets. Um, budgets are moral documents, they are philosophical documents, they are uh, policy documents, they are communications documents, uh, they are financial planning documents, they are operational documents. And just because they are tropes does not mean that they are not true. They're all of those things. Um, and so uh, what I hope to do right now is uh, uh, kind of express my thoughts on, on how these things work together. Um, uh, I am here because Attorney Mednick uh, asked me to, um, but I am also, I love Hartford. I worked in Hartford for 15 years. Um, I was married. I rented out Hartford City Hall to be married uh, uh, on one of the best days of my life. Um, I am looking forward to getting back to Hartford to uh, make a stop by Trinity Restaurant on Zion Street. And uh, on my way back home, DND &D Market in Weathersfield for a couple of prepared items. Um, because that's where I live most of my professional life. Um, and so to the extent that I can be even marginally uh, uh, helpful in this endeavor, um, I, will, uh, I will always do that 100% of the time. Um, so the city of Hartford has a budget, um, a sizable budget. Um, we'll call it $584 million. Um, I've had a chance to review Hartford's budgets uh, since 2000 in three different jobs uh, or two jobs in one volunteer assignment um, uh, through the Connecticut Policy and Economic Council, uh, through uh, uh, the MAR board, uh, which I served on uh, from its inception until uh, I left the state service uh, and uh, uh, a third one that I'm, I'm blanking on right now. Um, the budget is dynamic. The budget, in my estimation, is well presented. What do you want to do with your budget? And so I'll go back to the tropes that I started with. One is a communications tool. Now, it's too large. Uh, for any resident, any small business owner, any large business owner to read the whole thing and have a good sense. But you can certainly find those items uh, that you are looking uh, uh, to query. Um, it's available. It can probably be more available um, through the website. It takes a little bit of digging uh, and a couple of different uh, Google searches to get there. But you can get there. You can get the budget. You can understand uh, where the dollars are being spent. Um, and I'm not, hey, I'm finance director for a triple B community. So I'm not here to tell you where to spend your money. I'm just here to talk about uh, processes and, and presentation. Um, you know, you've got a good handle on, on OPEB issues. Uh, no one really has a good sense on OPEB. Um, but there's, uh, there's about $25 million set aside for OPEB. Uh, of that's other post employment benefits. That's essentially health care for retirees, uh, which, uh, I don't know, about 10 years ago, uh, the Government Accounting Standards Board created new standards that put everyone well behind the eight ball, saying you should pre-fund these, um, which is very difficult to do uh, in in the town of Hamden, the tenth largest community in Connecticut. That's seventeen million dollars a year uh, and a billion dollar liability. Uh, 
which no one no one can tax their way to a billion dollars uh you know in a year or two years or 10 years uh especially when you're used to paying for it on a pay as you go basis um you know the mill rate is high uh and that is an issue but the you know i'd like to say that there is a reason that during the recession of 2008 2009 Pontiac went out of business, yet Mercedes-Benz did not. They did just fine because people will pay for value. The issue is how you convey that value proposition to the people who are paying. Um, so I, 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 would, I would caution uh, the leaders of Hartford to, to continue to provide that value statement. Um, tax collection is good, 95.6, uh, and budgeted as an average of the last three years. That's a good strategy. Um, the, the capital budget uh, is, is on a pay-as-you-go basis through 2026. I would I would caution some level of review of that because what you don't want to do is because a state is paying the, the the existing debt service through the interim. But you always have to do roads, you always always have to do bridges, and there may not be grants, tiger grants or or whatever to support that. And so you want to avoid probably a significant um year over year bump uh because suddenly uh you have to pay for additional debt service um you know the revenue bonds uh uh and the 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 grant in lieu of taxes for u heart um continue to exist so you know that's going to be that's that's going to be something that needs to be managed but i think it's uh, it's perfectly um manageable um, the budget document itself um, is really one of the best in Connecticut that I've seen. You've got your five-year forecast, um, goals and objectives, both on the core side and on the departmental side. Uh, so anyone who wants to actually understand what you're trying to do, um, I think those are uh, available. Uh, one thing from a charter provision that I might want to add to this sort of granular detail thing is just, you, you know, management of one-time revenues. Uh, you know, one-time revenues, sale of a school, for example. Uh, it can, if you sell a school for a million dollars and you put it in the budget, then the next year, you have to fill the hole of a million dollars. And so when you start with holes, that starts to become a, a little bit of an issue. Um, there are significant um, guidance documents uh, uh, provided by GFOA, the uh, Government Finance uh, Officers Association and ICMA, the International City County Municipal Association, um, in terms of crafting budgets and what should be included with them. And I think that uh, uh, the city of Hartford could do well to ensure some sort of conformity to those guidelines and, in fact, seek um, recognition by those bodies for being a, a an outstanding and exemplary example of budgeting. Um, all you know, but at the end of the day, you got to sell this to taxpayers and stakeholders. Um, the mill rate 
is high. And people have to understand what they are paying for. And so in terms of budget presentation, um, that's what I would uh, what I would encourage the city to continue to enhance uh, and improve um, along with the, those clear goals and objectives, both at the enterprise level of the city in a departmental basis. Um, because it, it, things cost more. Uh, my mother always says to me, this didn't cost this much in 1955 when she was growing up. And I have to explain to her why that is the case. Uh, and I think that we in the government sphere need to uh, continually provide that information uh, to the folks that we represent. Uh, so um, those are my my broad uh, thoughts. Um, but I I really do think that the that the budgets crafted by the city of Hartford are really quite dynamic in comparison to uh, other budgets uh, around the state. And so when I worked at OPM, I was undersecretary at OPM, and I collected all the budgets from 169 towns and. And Hartford's was always uh, one of the best presentations. Doesn't mean that it can't be improved. Everything can be improved. Um, but I'm I'm happy to uh, yield my time uh, and answer any questions that may come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Jackson. All right, we will go next to uh, Alderman Per Naruski. Um, and uh, Commissioner Gallen Clark, we're going to hold questions till the end. Is that all right? Okay, great. Alderman Pernaruski, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I just, um, based on my conversation with Steve, just wanted to talk a little bit about the process that we had built into our charter when we did the charter revision back in 2002. Um, just as a little history, and, and I'm sure most of you are aware that Waterbury had a very difficult time uh, running into 2001. Uh, the city was in, in dire shape uh, financially. We also had a mayor who was um, being investigated for corruption and turned out to be involved with uh, things that were even far worse than that uh, and ended up going to jail. As a result though of the, the fiscal issues, we had uh, the, the city was fundamentally bankrupt in 2001. And we, we got an oversight board that had a, an extraordinary amount of power um, to deal with financial issues and with the help of the oversight board have been able to straighten out a lot of the things in water rate have really gone from junk bond status in 2001 to having a bond rating right now of double a minus so we, we've come a long way um, and in 2001 we had an opportunity to redo the charter I think Steve for the first time in like 50 years it hadn't really been redone in Waterbury so we had an opportunity to modernize it but a lot of the work that we did in the charter, because of when we were doing it, was done with an eye on the things that had happened in the past. And we were just coming off the, the, the mess that I've described. And uh, without exaggerating too much, and I was not uh, in, in city government at the time, but the last budget or one of the last budgets that Mayor Giordano put forward literally was made up of a document that basically said anticipated tax revenue. It had the, the expenditures required for the upcoming year. And the difference between those two numbers was just the line that said miscellaneous income. And that was what was presented to the alderman and with the support of the alderman from his party, that is the budget that passed. And you can see the deficit problems that we, we ran into as a result of that. So when we put together the process in our charter, we put together a really detailed process of what needs to get done. And uh, uh, we thought built in transparency to the, to the budget. So. Uh, there's a very defined time frame on when the mayor has to start submitting things to the Board of Aldermen, which is in April of the upcoming year. But, you know, historically, and, and Mayor O'Leary has, has been very good with this and his staff, they start that process back in November, reaching out to the department heads. Um, in January, they start putting their budgets together, working through what comes in. 
And by um, the end of March, they've got that submitted to the Board of Aldermen. But there's re requirements, and I mean, the charter requires that when the mayor reach out to the department heads, that they have to give him their estimates, the, the, the city provides them a form. <clears throat> and those have to be uh, a pretty detailed list that come out. They have to indicate uh, what services all the departments are gonna deliver in the upcoming year, what the costs of those are going to be. And they also have to list things that they feel are important, but that they haven't included in their estimates or in their budgets because they don't think they're fiscally feasible. So the mayor has an idea of what things his department heads aren't including when they're looking for the budget. Um, and they have to, at, at the time we were doing this, all of the health benefits and retiree benefits were done as a separate line item. So there was no allocation to the various departments. That's now all broken out. So we know the true operating cost of each department, not just the funds that they're expending and performing their services, but the cost of the employees, including healthcare and retirement going forward. Um, when the mayor submits his budget, he's got to have great detail in it. Uh, uh, he submits it to the board and he's got to include a, a budget message that uh, highlights all of the important features of the budget, explains all of the increases or decreases and changes uh, uh, in the budget he's recommending from prior years and has to show uh, comparisons uh, to those required uh, in, in all of the budget itemized by the principal sources and rev uh, of revenue and the main areas in which they're going to be um, uh, expended. Uh, so, uh, you know, he's really got to go through and estimate all the revenue and cash receipts, uh, the, the anticipated sources, uh, the surplus that exists at the end of the, uh, the, the current fiscal year, the expenses necessary for operating going forward, how much they are assuming they're going to raise through the tax levy and that specific. And the charter is even specific in there because we had the other issue we had with the prior administrations was estimates of tax revenue coming in at 99%. Now that's is not realistic. And so you're never gonna to get to those numbers. And again, you're forcing a deficit. So under the charter, the mayor is, um, is, is bound to uh, uh, have an anticipated collection rate of the uh, average uh, collection rate over the prior three years. So he's set over something that is realistically done. Now he can deviate from that, um, you know, if it's uh, uh, in excess of a three-year average, a rate of 93%, if that's, or um, let me just get this right now for it, at a rate of 93% or a deviation, um, deviation collection rate in excess of the three year average, uh, or a, a collection of 93%. But he's got to go to a board and get it, and get it, um, if he's going to deviate from that, that uh, three year average, he's got to go to a board that we created. Uh, and make sure they certify that that's realistic when he turns it into the Board of Aldermen. So part of what we did when we created this charter was create something called the Finance Audit and Review Commission. Uh, because again, one of the problems was the way the city was spending money and there was no real oversight uh, that had any teeth in it. So we created this board. It's set up to be um, non-political out of seven members on that board. Only three can be from any one political party. So no party can dominate the board. It's got to be made up of people who have a background in finance, uh, master's degrees or uh, 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 CPAs and, and things along that line. And that board has a great deal of investigative power if it wants to go in and see what issues are percolating through the city. It, it hires and fires the auditor on its own with no uh, control by the, the mayor's office or the board of aldermen. Uh, the, the, uh, the budget for that board cannot be lower than it was for the previous year, so you can't get rid of their oversight by simply underfunding them in any given year. All that's built in the charter. The other function they have is if the mayor does want to deviate higher than the stated collection rate, he's got to go to that FARC board. They then have to certify back to the Board of Aldermen that the mayor's estimates are, um, are realistic. So it's, it's an added protection in there. Um, and so once, the, once the, the Board of Aldermen gets the budget in March, they, they have to, within a week of getting the budget, but so, sometime within a week and two weeks in that period, they have to have a public hearing where they get input from the public on what the mayor's proposed budget is. Uh, and then they can spend uh, pretty much right through the end of May uh, uh, going through the budget. We create a budget subcommittee. Uh, lately, it's actually been the, the, the board sitting as a committee of the whole because most of the aldermen want to be involved in that. Uh, we bring in all of the department heads, go through all of their recommendations with them. 
All of the backup material is provided by the budget office uh, to the alderman. So it's not just the budget document, but it's all the work that goes into creating that document so they can see all of the details. Um, and the, and the, the board of aldermen goes through that and makes a determination on what they're going to do with the budget. And then at the end of that process, like between three days and a week before they finally adopt the budget, they have to have a second public hearing so that the public can weigh in on the work that they've done and what that final budget is going to be. So it, it's, as I said, it, it's, there's a lot that's built right into the charter. The idea is to make sure that people understand what's going on, make sure that the estimates and the, uh, what's put in there are realistic. They're based on fact and not on fiction. Uh, that the citizens can really see what's happening in there and that the, the people outside of just the mayor's office can have some control over it and can, uh, can be satisfied at the end that the budgets are going to work out. And the history of that over the last 20 years is from being it, it close to bankruptcy and having to issue deficit bonds in 2001, which we're still paying off, by the way, to having budgets that have run in surpluses of two, three, four million dollars a year annually um, and as I said, the, the bond rating going up to a to a, a double A minus. So it's been a fairly successful process for us. And that, that well, you know, at the end, I know we'll take some questions. So great, thank you very much. All right, up next we have Carl Goldfield. I think you're still muted, David. Can we unmute him? There we go. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, yes. Hello? Okay. Um, it's been a while since I've been involved with the city budgeting. I was, I was the president of the Board of Aldermen for a number of years, and I was retired a few years ago. So it's been a few years since I've been involved in, and there has been a, there was a charter revision subsequent to uh, when I left the board. But um, when I was there, and so, so I, I think the best I can do is give you a, uh, a perspective from, you know, a council member, which was what I was, a board of aldermen member, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, our perspective in getting a budget passed. Um, the process that we had in place was a, a lot like what uh, uh, Mr. Paderewski was describing. Um, I think New Haven uh, had a very transparent uh, process. We would, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, older people, uh, get a big budget uh, book at the beginning of the process and included in that budget book was uh, the um, requests that each of the departments had made to uh, the administration uh, for what they wanted uh, in terms of money and what they planned on doing with it. And they would uh, give us a, uh, a uh, plan of action for the year, you know, what the department uh, anticipated being able to accomplish and why they were asking uh, for the money uh, that they did. And we would see, you know, whether the, uh, to what extent the administration had agreed that uh, they would go with the department heads request. And obviously the department heads are always gonna ask for more than, uh, than uh, they're gonna get and the administration's gonna cut them back to some degree. Uh, you know, I don't, I think regardless of what the charter says, um, the uh, administration, uh, you know, the mayor's office, they, they have the whip hand in, in the budgeting because they uh, tend to have the, uh, you know, they have the sophistication and the time to uh, really pour through this stuff. And, and we as a board of aldermen in New Haven, there were 30 of us. And we came from all sorts of backgrounds. You know, some of us were sophisticated financially. Some people, you know, would come on the board and, and they wouldn't know what a bond was. You know, and, I, and that's not a criticism. They're just, you know, they're everyday people coming on the board. They're community activists. They have no acquaintance with this kind of stuff. So uh, one of the things we did uh, 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 was 
we created the FRAC, which was the uh, Financial Review and Accounting Commission, oh, an Auditing Commission. And um, because as a board, you know, we recognized that we didn't have that kind of expertise and we felt we needed uh, somebody to help us out. Uh, so the FRAC was created and they were supposed to be a, a board of financially sophisticated people who could look behind, help us to look behind what the administration was delivering and, uh, and uh, make suggestions or point out weaknesses or flaws or, you know, whatever in, in what we were getting. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, they were never in my, during my tenure, and I think it's continued, uh, they were never adequately funded um, to really be able to have the time and for themselves to be able to, you know, farm some of this out. To, to really have an, uh, uh, be effective. And, and, and when you're thinking about, uh, I would highly recommend that you create that kind of mechanism for the city council to have. Uh, because again, I, I'm, I'm gonna assume that Hartford, like New Haven, you have people who you know, can't devote the time and don't have the financial expertise to uh, really be a counterweight uh, to the mayor's office. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is that um, uh, during my years, it was always frustrating um, how much of the budget was dictated for us before we could even get to it. And I think it was somewhat frustrating for the for the uh, mayor as well, which was that, you know, you have these pension obligations and they're not going anyplace. And you have uh, bonding that was issued before you were in office and that's not going anyplace. And the fire department has to be funded and they have a union contract behind them. And the police department has to be funded and they have a union contract behind them. And then you have the school board I mean, you have a, the school system and the school system has state mandates as to how much you have to provide. Um, so, you know, the amount of discretionary spending uh, was that we could really move around, you know, was not tremendous. And uh, so we would go through the budget and there would be some initiatives that members of the board would feel strongly about. And we would be able to come up with some money uh, for those initiatives. But we were also fortunate. We had a very competent mayor, I think, John DeStefano at the time. We had uh, competent financial people. And we were delivered budgets that largely, not entirely, because let's face it, you know, all Connecticut uh, municipalities are sucking wind for money, you know, and there's going to be a certain amount of uh, fooling around the fill holes, you know, where, you know, you described uh, Mr. Paderewski, your mayor coming in with a gigantic line item, you know, that you had no idea where the revenue was going to come from. And, and we had a bit of that, you know, where we would have, you know, anticipated savings or, you know, whatever. And, uh, but I think in the end, you know, we did as well as we could. And, 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 and uh, Scott Jackson said something, which, you know, uh, I didn't understand before I got involved and in it was, was it how, how dynamic budgeting is. I mean, you're setting this, these goals and you're setting these, but, but it's all going to change as the year goes on. Not all of it, but uh, large chunks of it. And um, the other, and, and from the standpoint of the public coming in and testifying on the budget, you know, I, all that transparency is really necessary. You know, it really is. But we found that the public would come in and for them, it was all about how much am I going to pay in taxes? That was the bottom line. They, I don't ever, uh, there were a few instances when taxes the, uh, were going up where we had really sophisticated people can't come in who had gone through the budget thoroughly, and were and had taken it apart and and were critical of it, uh, critical of parts of it. Um, but we had a, a lot more people from the public who were just upset about the fact that their taxes were going up and and 
and they never had proposals as to where we could cut or how we could raise more revenue besides taxes, except tax Yale, which obviously we weren't going to do so or, or couldn't do. Um, so uh, in sum, in conclusion, I would say that, you know, and I was thinking about this this afternoon, from a city council standpoint, whatever mechanism you can give the city council to bulk them up, to give them the tools and the, and the sophisticated advice, you know, to be a counterweight to the administration, I, I think is really important. All right, thank you very much. Um, and we will move on to our final presentation of the evening. Um, Michael Pollard, you have the floor and uh, we'll give David Grant just a moment to pull up the presentation on everyone's screen. Okay. Mr. Pollard, I believe you can be here. All right, very good, and uh, good evening to everyone, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, meet with you and to share with you uh, what we have uh, been doing and are doing here in Stanford with respect to its budget process uh, and give you some insights in terms of some of our uh, the items required of us by the Charter. And I would start off by simply saying that uh, I, I, I love to look at the positions I've had within the city of Stanford as relate to budget. Uh, first of all, I was a taxpayer back in 1991 to current date. Uh, then in 2003, I became a member of the Board of Finance for the uh, city of uh, Stanford. And that actually was during the era of time where Dan Malloy would have been mayor at Stanford. Uh, then I actually came back as chief of staff in 2013 and remain in that position to the current date. Uh, and it's fascinating to see how the city has grown and changed from its financial position, but there's certain things that haven't changed. And I'll just share a couple of thoughts with you as we go along. Uh, the process is consistently the same. And honestly, I think what you're gonna discover is it's not too dissimilar uh, to what you heard from Waterbury and from what one of the other cities as well. Uh, it's a very similar process. And if you don't mind, go to the next slide and I'll show you what, what I'm referring to. Uh, within the city of Stanford, the process uh, centers around uh, the OPM operation within Stanford, within Stanford, sends to the departments the request to prepare its budget and to submit those budgets back to them so they can then reconcile those budgets with instructions that they've received from the mayor. There are particular, uh, particular types of, 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 uh, of initiatives that the mayor will communicate is our priorities and there are other areas which demand to be priorities within the city. Uh, when they come back to OPM, they then are submitted to the mayor uh, for the mayor to do review and consideration of what he uh, would like to see move forward in the budget process. Uh, and then from there, it goes to our board of finance, I'm sorry, a board of finance, which the board of finance then will in essence make the first uh, approval of that particular submission. Then the Board of Representatives will uh, then make their approval and both boards can cut the budget, but in the city of Stanford, you cannot add anything to the budget. So Board of Finances and Board of Reps, uh, they cannot add anything to a budget. They can only reduce the budget. Uh, and then finally, after the Board of Representatives, and by the way, there are generally two stops within the Board of Representatives for us, uh, same as your alderman, by the way, in the event that you've got some nomenclature differences. Uh, the, there's two stops within the Board of Reps. One is a physical committee, uh, which is made up of nine individuals, which are elected officials from the city. Uh, and that group then refers the budget to the final full board of representatives for them to act on it. Once they act on it, then the budget is deemed to be final and that is that. And then the second aspect of the budget is that we then have a session by the board of finance, which then sets the mill rate, uh, i.e. Uh, assessing what the revenues will be to support the budget. Hence another opportunity if you want to, and that happens sometime, to adjust the budget based on what they deem to be an appropriate level of spending. So that's the general process that we go through. I can go through a little bit more in detail, but let me give you a little bit about 
philosophy within the city of Stanford, because I know many people will look at Stanford and say, hey, it's a nice, big, wealthy community. It's growing. It's doing really well. Uh, but having lived here 31 years, Stanford is not always conformed to that. It has had large corporations here, but it's not always been a growth oriented city. Uh, in fact, there's a number of times we found it to be quite stagnant. Uh, with that being said, what I would share with you is that uh, the philosophy, as I became a member of the Board of Finance in 2003, has really not changed that much. The philosophy centers first around, it is a very conservative board. Uh, so it is not one that tends to spend lots of money uh, on personnel and staff. In fact, uh, we have the smallest, Stanford has the smallest number of employees per capita of any city in the state or of any large city in the state. We have less employees per capita than any other city in the state. Nobody has less employees that we have. That includes our police department. If you look at our police staffing, relatively small compared to many other cities. And that's generally a result of the boards themselves being very clear that to justify additional staffing, uh, you're gonna have to present business cases that show that there's an extreme need for it. On any given year, our, our, um, our, but our board will likely approve new positions in Stanford, anywhere between about four, about uh, six to eight positions. On average, you're gonna see about that number of new positions created. That's not very much when you look at the size city and the size operation that we have. That said, there's also a sense that, you know, the growth within our city does help offset the burden within the individual owners of property within the city of Stanford. Uh, and what I have to remind people is that there are kind of two Stanfords. Uh, that clearly there's what is called North Stanford and also Japan. Those are the most affluent parts of Stanford. And honestly, if you looked at them, you'd be hard to tell the difference between that, uh, those locations and Greenwich and New Cana. They look very much the same. The demographics are very much similar to those areas. However, the east side of our, of our city and the west side of our city, honestly, it looks very much like parts of Waterbury. It looks like parts of, uh, of Bridgeport. Uh, the uh, number of individual census tracts that we have a no large number of census tracts where poverty is in the 20% right, is in the 20 percentile area. So it is not as if Stanford doesn't have low income people or low income houses. We have probably some of the uh, largest number of low income houses of any city as well in the state as well. So, you know, it's a little bit dece deceptive at times when you look at Stanford in terms of how it actually is comprised of this various groups of demographically mixed both income as well as diverse mix of people. So if you don't mind, go to the next slide. I'll go back to the, uh, the process itself. Uh, I think, I think uh, it was Paul who, who may have walked through the process, but here's actually what we sent out to our departments. These are actually dates and times that the process will carry forward our budget in. So we, in essence, and actually I could have started as early as uh, September because in September we uh, initiate the request to departments for capital. So our capital budgeting process effectively starts really within the next week or so where we'll begin to make the departments aware that they should put their requests together and prioritize them. Uh, following that, we eventually uh, have the planning board for capital to also uh, receive the budget or their budget from the departments. Uh, and then they will add yet a second layer of prioritization to the projects. Uh, and then for capital, again, uh, the mayor in December will get the presentation from the board of, of uh, the planning board. And he then will prioritize what he deems to be the priorities for the city in the capital budget. That is then submitted in a big book like everybody else has uh, to the boards of finance and to the board of representatives. Wow. So that's the capital side. The operating side really uh, starts uh, in October. We'll actually send out instruction sets. I'm sorry, in November, we'll send out instructions to all departments as to what we deem to be the priorities for the city for the year. Uh, and we generally make it very clear that you have to show a strong business case as to why your budget is changing from last year to the upcoming uh, fiscal year. Uh, and that process uh, lasts up until, uh, I do believe the mayor gets his, his presentation with all budgets in it at the end of, uh, at the end of February. 
He then has a few weeks to work through the budget to then decide what the final budget will look like. And he is by mandate required to submit that budget to the board on March, on the first Monday in uh, the second Monday in March. So that begins then the deliberation by all our boards in terms of what will and will not be included uh, in, the, uh, in the budget for the upcoming year. Uh, I would tell you our process has been one that has been riddled with problems. Uh, I would tell you also that our fiscal system is as RK, I, in fact, I'd almost be willing to bet there's probably nobody who has a financial system older than the city of Stanford. I'd almost be willing to bet. Our system is one that is a 1980s technology. It is green screen. And it is one that uh, the city would have acquired in about 1994. We're still operating on. Uh, and because of that, we this year uh, have finally uh, convinced our boards to include in the budget, in the capital budget, uh, the cost of replacing that system, which will we, which we have already begun to initiate the replacement of it with a, a enterprise resource planning system, ERP system, uh, and we're right now in the step going through the steps of really bringing on board the vendor and the system itself. Uh, is our expectation by about the th uh, third quarter of 2022, we'll have that system ready to roll out uh, across the city. But because we're, roll, we're currently operating on a green screen system, there's a number of things from a uh, budget and budget process standpoint we would like to do but simply can't do uh, because we just simply lack the technology platform to do it. One example of that would be uh, a few years ago, I, I, I encouraged the mayor and said, well, we should really look at how much do the service delivery cost us in each of the service areas that we provide to the community. Uh, so that when a board says, look, we're going to reduce your recycling budget by 10 percent, what does that translate into in terms of our services that we're able to deliver? So we're trying to map service to the actual uh, operating budget itself so that when adjustments and changes occur, we know how it affects the service. And therefore, we can tell citizens, here's what you'll expect with this change in the budget for this line of service. But we can't do it because we've got this old archaic system. Uh, we also wanted to really try to get away from a line item budget book, uh, which literally, I'm sure all of us see the same thing, literally hundreds of lines of, of individual budget items. Uh, and honestly, having said on the Board of Finance, uh, I really think that uh, we can get pretty nitpicky on this. Uh, we can all of a sudden decide that all we want to do is we want to cut 20% out of the paper, copier paper budget, which is a waste of everybody's time. And hence what we need to really focus more on, in my opinion, and I think the boards uh, will, uh, will agree with me over time, is that we, again, we need to go back and look at what is the service impact uh, by having changes in budget line items. So those are, those are some of the things that we have seen uh, from a charter standpoint. Uh, we only have those statutory dates that you see on the page that are really required from a structural standpoint. Uh, the, the charter only requires us to have the mayor to submit to the boards of finance. And it also uh, requires us to have the planning board uh, as a part of the process for the capital budget. Uh, and then it's only board of finance and board of representatives. So that's just kind of a quick snapshot of what we encounter here in Stanford from a budget process standpoint and what we're looking at. You can skip all that, I'm trying to save us some time. <laughs> By the way, let me just go back. The slide he just showed you just simply goes into more granular detail on the activities associated with preparing our budget. So if you get this presentation, you'll get a few more, uh, you know, one layer down deeper than that earlier slide. If you go to the next slide, all it does, it really just talks about the capital budget process, which I orally just described to you. And that's pretty much it. Don't go to the next one because that's something we'll, we'll probably talk about separately. And that's it. All right. Thank you all very much for these presentations. Uh, incredibly helpful, incredibly informative. And what we will do now is we will open it up to questions from the commissioners. I know. Commissioner Gallon Clark, you had raised your hand uh, a couple of speakers ago, so I'll address you first. You have okay, thank you. And thank you, um, Attorney Metnick, for arranging this. this. This has been very enlightening. I do have a question for Mayor Jackson. And Mayor, you have indicated that you got to sell 
this budget to the taxpayers. And my question to you is, and I think it was alluded to by several of you, a lot of the residents, they don't have the information, they don't have the background to really understand this bulky package that may be on the website or may be handed to them. What have you seen in Hamden um, that has really worked to educate and increase awareness so that when residents do go into the public hearings, they're informed, they're engaged, they can ask very intelligent questions about the budget. What have you done? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I did uh, that took me a Saturday. I took an image of a dollar bill and I broke it out by pixels in terms of where the money was going. And so this was, this was more than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the technology is, is probably a whole lot finer. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I was talking to one of my neighbors from the next block and he said, uh, you know, the, the taxes are high and, and Hampton is certainly one of the top 10 tax towns in Connecticut. Uh, and, you know, so I broke down the big numbers. So this goes to police, this goes to fire, this goes to debt service, this goes to, to pension. You tell me where you would um, make cuts that would, would be material to the, um, uh, to the middle rate. And I've been asking that question you know, so I'm the finance director now. I was mayor for for three terms, uh, and I'm back home. Um, but I've been asking that question since 2009, and in large measure, people want to have more. They don't necessarily want to pay for more, <laughs> and so when confronted with that. Um, you know, with that sort of uh, cognitive dissonance, they understand a little bit better um, the issues that, uh, you know, that elected and appointed officials face. But I think I, I, the, my, my strategy is to be completely honest and just say, here's where the money's going. And if you've got a problem with where the money is going, and you can't come back to me and say, oh, well, you should just kill the pension because that's an untenable solution. So you have to say that's, uh, that's not allowable under law. <laughs> so you gotta come back with something else. Um, and, and that has been successful for me, um, uh, but it's a question that every person seeking to be elected uh, needs to be able to answer in a realistic and honest fashion. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm just curious, did anyone else want to weigh in on what has worked to make sure that residents come in fully engaged, fully informed? Well, we got Michael Pollard from Stanford. One of the things I did when I was on the Board of Finance back in 2007, eight window of time is that I thought, surveys would really kind of help. It does two things. One is it allows us to collect data and insight in terms of what uh, community residents are thinking, but it also uh, gets in front of them the things that we are trying to, you know, prioritize and determine how best to prioritize. The only problem with it is exactly what Scott said. You know, they want everything, but they don't want to give anything up. So, and that's exactly what we found in 2008, but I'm a diehard. So I come back on the administrative side, but this time we run a survey in a different way. Uh, we basically said, what are your priorities? Not necessarily associated with a budget, but rate the service that you're getting from each area of the city, rate your police, rate your fire, you know, rate your education. Uh, and do you think there's additional funding that we need to associate with those departments? So we're not asking you where to put the money. We're asking you what's important to you, most important. And then do you think it needs more funding there? And actually this year, it tends to have given us a great deal better insight in terms of how best to uh, set the budget. Thank you so much. 
And if you want to see a um, more sophisticated version of what uh, Mayor Jackson was referring to, Justin Elliker, uh, a few years ago, did a, a very sophisticated, almost cartoon of budgeting. And I, I don't know where you would find it now, but he uh, you might call his office and ask, I'm sure they still have it, but it was very clever and it was very clear and, and was really a great illustration of where our money was going. I thought it was very effective. Yeah, if I could give just a compliment to New Haven, I would tell you when we tried to find best practice models for how to communicate to the community what the budget looks like, uh, they have probably in my opinion, one of the best and most transparent websites that allow citizens to really drill down to see where their money is going. So oh. I think from a best practice standpoint, I'd certainly say New Haven is one of the best I've seen. Okay. And, and I, would, I would echo that uh, uh, in my time as chief administrative officer in New Haven, um, participating in the FRAC meetings that Mr. Goldfield mentioned um, was really, uh, really valuable. Um, these are citizen volunteers who do deep dives into the budgeting and uh, uh, spending. Uh, and they come up with some really good ideas and, you know, encouraging through <laughs> these types of, um, you know, sort of sideline uh, entities, I, I think offers a lot of value to the community as a whole. Great, thank you so much. But I, I would repeat my, uh, my point, which was that frack was good, but they needed more funding and more help. You know, they were a good counterbalance, but they weren't sufficiently funded. So, so if you're thinking about that kind of mechanism, you know, you wanna give them, wanna give them the resources to be able to do the job. Mm -hmm. So I guess one question on that then is, um, you have the you have a crack in New Haven, but uh, do you also have a budget analyst position that the, the board of alders um, supports? Yeah, it's interesting because I was thinking we did, and 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 it depended on how good that person was. And over my years on the board of aldermen, which were many, you know, we 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 went from having budget analysts who just, you know, were not very good to, to budget analysts who were excellent, you know, people who were really sophisticated, again, understood how this was all put together, and they were very helpful. And we had a board of finance, Steve, you, I think when you were on the board, the board of finance existed. And there was, uh, we had a board president who felt that the board of finance was not democratic enough, that it was too removed and that, that all that uh, authority should go to the board of aldermen directly, that they're the board. And I don't know whether that was a, maybe a, having a board of finance would have been uh, the way to go. Maybe we made a mistake there, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Pollard, maybe you can speak to that because it sounds like Stanford has a board of finance. Yeah, I'm gonna apologize, but re repeat the question so I make sure I got it clear, I got distracted. No, I, I said that New Haven had a board of finance <laughs> and, and, uh, and at one point uh, we had a board president who felt that the board of finance was somewhat undemocratic and what it did should, yeah devolved directly to the Board of Aldermen. So we, we eliminated the Board of Finance. And I, I just, was just curious, you know, how does the Board of Finance work in Stanford? And yeah. Well, does it, it work it, well? It, Who points yeah, it, I, you know? I, I think it, elected. Yeah, they are, these are elected officials from across the entire city. They're not elected by districts. Uh, they're elected citywide. Uh, so I think there's good news and bad news with the election process because there's some communities that feel like that they are disenfranchised because 
they don't see you know, individuals like themselves on the board. Uh, however, that being said, it does tend to produce uh, a, a, a professional group of people. I would say if I look at our boards over the years that I'm, I've been familiar with, generally these are all people with some form of professional degrees. They may not be in finance, but clearly have had some uh, strong professional acumen. Uh, so when they sit down, they, they generally are uh, you know, making some very, uh, very insightful views of budgets. However, more recently, though, I have seen where uh, because it lacks in its diversity at times uh, that there seems to be you know, a view by some in the community that, you know, that they're that they are disadvantaged. Now, I'll give you an example. We when we got our, our uh, relief fund uh, from the federal government, uh, we you know, had the Board of Finance basically in essence declared what and how the funds would be used, which mainly is, is in capital. Uh, in a short term, short term capital. Uh, and that works out well by and large for most cities. However, uh, there are many who argue that that board probably should have had more input from the community as to where that money should have been spent. Uh, perhaps on more human, uh, human services program uh, and jobs related programs. But that, that being said, that's one of the few times where I actually seen there seemed to have been a bit of a disconnect between the community and the board itself. But by and large, it serves for us more as a watchdog, uh, and it tends to be the conservative break for any mayor that comes along that tend to want to be very aggressive in spending. Steve? Yeah, I want to make one point. Uh, Michael was talking about the process in Stanford um, a few moments ago, and he made, he made the point that the... Um, the uh, legislative bodies, the Board of Finance and Board of Reps, uh, may cut but may not add uh, to the budget process. One thing Michael didn't talk about, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and you'll see this in the comparative chart that I'm going to be providing for you, is the process ends with the Board of Finance. There's no mayoral veto. Am I correct on that, Michael? You're 100% correct. There's nothing a mayor can do. Yeah, so the process ends with the Board of Finance, and hence that's the reason I think their charter put that cap in there. Going back to what um, Carl uh, raised a few moments ago, uh, I chaired the finance committee uh, when I was on the board in the late eighties through the early nineties. Um, and I was an opponent of the board of finance, um, um, largely on the same grounds. I think that George Perez um, uh, opposed them in terms of lack of democratic principles, the board of finance in Stanford is an elected body. The Board of Finance in New Haven was an appointed body. Actually, it was chaired by my uh, ward chairman, who was a, a political ally of mine at the time. So it was a little uncomfortable um, uh, during that period of time. And we wanted to make sure that there was legislative authority uh, in New Haven. And so when the FRAC was formed, um, the FRAC gave impetus to the plan that we did uh, going to Paul Pernaruski uh, with the FARC, <laughs> FRAC and FARC. Um, the, the FARC was an audit entity. The FRAC was more of a budget analyst, uh, uh, analysis entity. Um, and so, um, but with the FARC and Waterbury, they really created an ironclad capacity for that body to be sustained uh, and to ensure that no mayor could undermine, or, or no board of aldermen for that matter, could undermine the authority of the body and its, um, and its uh, broad broad uh, audit capacity. Um, this past year, coming full circle, and I hope you don't mind that I'm, I'm doing this, I'm trying to bring all these things together. In Hamden, and I think uh, uh, Mayor Jackson speak, speak to this, um, I did full circle in this kind of panel that we had, and Paul Pernerski participated in the panel in Hamden uh, this past year. Um, we created a finance commission at the Charter Revision Commission level. And the Finance Commission is more like the, um, the uh, frac in New Haven, but we gave it uh, some greater ability, but we also made it a legislative dominated entity. So the, the legislative body would have the, be the dominant appointing authority, the mayor, the subordinate appointing authority uh, to do the kind of analysis that, um, um, that the Audit Commission does um, in some, some sense in um, in Waterbury. Uh, unfortunately, a week ago, uh, for reasons that I may never understand until I'm playing shuffleboard down in Florida someday, um, the, uh, the, the Hamden Council um, killed the charter. 
um, and, and it's not clear why, but um, I have some really good language, I will tell you, on a good finance entity that could be beneficial and helpful to a legislative body. And, uh, and it, borrows, it borrows, frankly, from Stanford. Um, Michael will recognize aspects of um, the finance authority in Stanford uh, and borrows from the uh, FARC and Waterbury. So uh, uh, just bringing all those things together. And Michael Malone, who spoke on the panel, who was a, the controller at the time that I was chair of the finance committee opposing the board of finance, uh, had his jaw hit the ground when I told him I was supporting a finance commission uh, all those years later. But there was a, there was a reason for it. And it, and it was not going to be um, a superior body to the legislative body. It would be a supportive body to the legislative body. And I think um, if you set it up properly, you may uh, um, circumvent the problems that New Haven is having uh, with having a stronger, um, a stronger frack. If I could through the chair. Yes, Commissioner Kennedy. Um, I mean, I, I, there, these are some excellent ideas. I did not, was not aware of the, um, of these, what, what Stanford, Waterbury and, um, and New Haven have. I mean, we have our audit commission. However, our audit commission doesn't touch any of the processes related to the budget. Um, and some of the discussions I've had with respect to council needing a, essentially a budget expert to help them review the, the budget process, um, you know, we're, that's not a full-time position. You know, what, what would you do with that person in the meantime? And where would you put that person within the budget and still have them only report to the legislative body? I mean, I think what's, what Steve has brought up, you're all very good points. Um, we had the framework in the audit commission. How do you expand it? Um, how do you give it a budget process and then make sure it is still subordinate to the legislative body? Um, and I'd be very interested in having, you know, what the, how you develop that, how you, how you do that. Because um, they could provide the level of expertise that the council has been talking about for years. Um, could be provided through the audit commission um because we already set it up you can't reduce their budget right um they have certain protections that are already there that that have been the same protections for the other that the other cities have built into their uh, financial reviews um so i mean i think that's a i mean we have some potential there to do something maybe very unique just for you know not not necessarily copying what the other cities have done but doing something very unique for the city of hartford thank you commissioner any other, uh, Commissioner Gale, Councilman Gale. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thanks to all of you who've made presentations tonight. I, I'm, I'm a, a little fascinated by, um, I guess it's um, both Stanford and, um, and Waterbury uh, that's, that have these finance commissions. And I know, you know, I, I've sort of, understand that some of our suburban communities around Hartford have finance commissions that are elected. Um, we in Hartford have uh, a strong mayor form of government instituted back in 2001 at this point. So we did not have it prior to that. We had a council manager form of government. We have the strong mayor form of government now with the city council. And our process goes from the mayor creating the budget uh, with his de with the department heads um, and then presenting the budget to council that then deliberates and can uh, can make uh, such changes as council uh, deems appropriate. Um, but I'm hearing that in these other communities, there's like an interim step. There's a finance commission, or it has seems to have other name. Finance board has other names, um, and I guess I'm just not understanding the extent to which this then takes power and decision-making in, in my case, I mean, I'm a council member, I'm on the Hartford city council. I've been passing budgets. I've now passed six of them. And, um, uh, and, and I relish that. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a grueling process, but uh, uh, you know, I, I read that budget book and I figure out where I want to, uh, where I might want uh, to spend more money or I might want to cut money. Um, and I make suggestions to others and I try to build a consensus around uh, a couple of things. So I'm a, I'm a little concerned when I hear about a, um, 
uh, a finance commission as to the extent to which that somehow dilutes my power or takes my uh, my vote away uh, from being the ultimate decision maker. Uh, and so I'm interested to hear, I guess, from Stanford, uh, Michael, and and uh, and maybe Paul from you and, and Waterbury, how you view these um, these finance commissions and what the what the interplay is between these commissions and your, your city council or your legislative body, if you will. Yeah, this is really interesting in Stanford in that the charter itself actually uh, defines the powers of which the board of finance, which is what we call our fiscal board, uh, has within the budget process, but also in the fiscal management of the city. Uh, so that board also has responsibilities in areas, for, for example, like incremental appropriation for projects uh, and programs. Uh, it actually goes only to the Board of Finance. That is because that's what the charter calls for it to have. So the charter envisioned having two bodies that are literally peer bodies of sorts. They don't see a superior versus a subordinate. Is viewed as literally two peer bodies. Uh, however, from a from a board of finance or board of representatives or board of aldermen, as you might call it, uh, they actually in the budget process actually has kind of the last voice. What we historically have seen within the city of Stanford is that when the budgets are brought forth, the vast majority of the reductions, because keep in mind that's all you can do on a board here in Stanford, is reduce the budget. The vast majority of those reductions, as much as 80 or 90 percent, is actually done by the Board of Finance. However, the Board of Representatives also has, or the Board of Aldermen also has power to make further reductions. And they have. You know, they'll add another 10 percent cut or 15 percent cut that they can add. So they uh, work together in that they provide a foundation of reductions for the budget that, that really complement each other to a great extent. So that's what you see here. It's, it's not defined as one is superior and subordinate. It doesn't work that way. They both are equal views and both have their distinct powers as defined by charter. And in Waterbury, the, the, the FAR Commission has only a very limited role to play with the budget, which is in the event that the mayor wants to deviate on the anticipated tax revenues beyond the three-year average, he would need to have a certification from the FARC that that is a realistic um, expectation. But otherwise, they're not part of the budget process. The FARC board in Waterbury actually replaced what was a more conventional board of finance that had existed um, prior to that. And they, as was described in Stanford, they dealt with a lot of the financial issues first, and then they came to the Board of Aldermen. But one of the things, and again, our, our charter in 2002 was an outgrowth of all of the problems and issues the city had been having you know, through, through really decades of mismanagement. And one of the things that we realized when we looked at the process was there were an awful lot of people who were involved in it. And so there was no one person or entity in many cases that was responsible for it. So everyone was sort of relying or casting blame on other people. So we brought a lot of that back and, and brought that back to the Board of Aldermen. So in our case, the mayor sends the budget to the Board of Aldermen. The Board of Aldermen can approve it. They can increase it or decrease it. Uh, then it goes back to the mayor. He has the ability to veto it. And the board has one more chance to override the veto if they so choose. But those are the only the two entities that actually craft and adopt the budget. The board, the, the FARC board, with, with only that limited role has nothing else to do with the budget process in Waterbury. Yes. Steve and then Commissioner Kennedy. Yeah, uh, Councilman Gale, the finance commission that we had proposed in Hamden was not proposed to be uh, an encroachment on the legislative process. It was supposed to be an enhancement of the legislative process. Uh, when the budget was submitted by the mayor to the legislative body, the intent was to have the finance commission look at the revenue side and to really do some deep dives into the revenue side um, and during the budget process be able to certify to the council that those numbers are sound numbers, that they, they were based on um, uh, real, uh, real uh, demonstrable um, information. Uh, they do not, were not intended to address the lines in the budget at all, had no vote on the budget, they were simply intended to be kind of subject matter experts appointed three by the mayor, uh, three by the council and two by the uh, mayor uh, to provide that buffer, uh, to, to provide um, a check 
to then give information to the council. So in the final action by the council, they would have this other body that would be assisting them. So um, it would not encroach it and uh, would have violated my principles completely based on my opposition to a board of finance in, in uh, New Haven back in the early 90s. And, and specifically on that, on that point, um, uh, Hamden has no intermediary group. Uh, it's a 15 member legislative council, each one of whom has a distinct and individual authority over 700 lines in a budget. And so it can get to be a little bit messy at times. Um, I compare it, um, uh, you know, and I'm looking at you, Mr. Goldfield, um, I compare it to the city of New Haven, which has a, a, a board twice the size but there is expertise that is developed within the board. Hamden has uh, essentially 15 generalists. Uh, and so it can, it can get to be a little bit uh, uh, of an issue um, in terms of actually getting through the process. Commissioner Kennedy? Yeah, and that's the case. We had a board, uh, we had a uh, finance committee on the board and you're exactly right. They, they ha had an expertise. Uh, if, if I may, um, and to address the, the councilman's point, um, John, uh, I have no interest in trying to uh, weaken council's uh, power uh, through this charter. I actually want to increase council's authority um, to try to make a more balanced with the strong air form of government. Um, but throughout the 15 plus budgets that I sat through, um, and when I was chair for about probably 14 of those years, um, council does is not on the same level of expertise as the administration. Um, despite the fact that we linked in out the budget process, um, you know, the two weeks plus, um, council still was at a disadvantage. Um, we were only limited temporary employees. Um, it was very hard for, for council people to go through the budget. We assigned, you know, each council member specific departments. It was just very hard for council to, to play catch up, so to speak, and to do it in a, in a condensed two week period, the way we have it structured now. I think the whole point of the budget process is to try to one, have the budget delivered sooner. I think we all think that's appropriate. Not, not, near the end of May, or the end of April, excuse me, but maybe the beginning of March when the mayor delivers the city address. And then have someone there to help council go through the budget, who is an expert. Um, like Hamden, we have a whole bunch of generalists. We have nine generalists. Um, sometimes we get a finance person. Most times we get a bunch of lawyers. <laughs> and lawyers are not good business people. <laughs> um, you know, um, you know. <laughs> Uh, um, they built pretty well. <laughs> speak for <Yes>. yourself. <laughs> uh, Wait, I will, I I will speak that for my, remark. I will speak for myself. Um, you know, but I, I've known uh, uh, quite a few. I'm a public practitioner, but I've known a lot of other people in private practice, and um, their uh, business abilities have not been impressive. Not like their legal skills. Um, and so, getting <laughs> someone. Getting someone who's, who's a budget expert um, who can really show you and break it down for council, and maybe not just one person, maybe two. I mean, we haven't had that discussion yet as a body, but I have no interest in trying to make um, the audit commission or wherever we put these folks to be the equal of council. No, I just want them supporting council in their budget process. I mean, what these other towns have, I think is something we really have to explore not out of fear that we'll weaken council or create some other body. I, I'm not even interested in that. But council does need the support to adequately go through the budget. Um, right now, you, what was that, uh, um, Stephen um, and Mr. Chair? Right now, isn't there a body that's been created that reviews the budget before the uh, Hartford, Hartford um, City Council does? The MARB. The MARB. Yeah. We're asking for more has to look Mark. at the budget yeah. ultimately. So yes, um, and, I, and I hate that process. Yeah, that's not a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good process. <laughs> nothing wrong with the MARB. Uh, I think we can have some disagreement about that. But, well, go um, ahead. 
haven't served under one. I did not serve under one. You're correct. All right. All right. All right. That's... Um, but um, I still, I thought that took away from some of council's legislative authority. Not in the least. I can tell you it, the MARV has not affected our legislative authority in the least, to, to my knowledge. Now, you could, there's eight other council members, and they may speak differently. Uh, but up to this point, we've made tons of changes to the budget, post it being presented to the, to the state uh, by the mayor, and not one of those changes has been uh, overturned by the MARV. Well, uh, so, so, it hasn't, so, so it has not affected my ability as a council member or any other council member's ability to my knowledge. For the purpose of this discussion, I will accept that. Um, and just say that uh, I wanted to address your concern about council losing authority. Um, and that I don't think that was anyone's objective. And I don't think even entertaining this discussion about where to, how other towns have done it, uh, I, I did not see that as a potential an issue unless you set up a separate body that has a veto authority over the council. So, uh, I, John, I, I see where you're coming from, but I think let's let this play out. I think you may be very happy in the end where it goes. All right. Any other questions for our panelists this evening? Mr. Yeah, Chairman? Let's stop at 30 to, uh, to respect their time. Commissioner Rubenstein? Yes. First, I want to thank the presenters for an absolutely excellent presentation, and I want to thank uh, Attorney Mednick for putting it all together. It's really an excellent uh, presentation tonight. I want to take just a moment to, to just mention that uh, in the last decade or two, we've seen um, more and more state budgets being put together in special sessions beyond the June, generally June ending date, which tends to wreck havoc to some degree with the city, city budgets and hopefully we can go back to more regular order having budgets passed uh, in the regular scheme of things in the regular terms uh, but I do want to take a moment to associate myself uh, with uh, uh, Councilman Kennedy's remarks with uh, with regard to enhancing the uh, overall uh, scope and power of, of the council vis-a-vis -vis the other branches of government. Uh, and, um, and I do like particularly the idea of the budget or two analysts, and I know it'll be a discussion later uh, uh, to help the council along with their budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gallon Clark. One last question for me tonight, and that is to Mr. Pillard. When you went over your timeline, you showed March 23rd for public hearings. Is it only one day or one night designated for public hearings? I yes. just want a clarification. Yeah, statutorily required one night. However, in the board's meeting, they're also an option for public participation. So if you don't get to the, you know, the public hearing, which that's a joint hearing with the Board of Finance and the Board of Representatives, uh, you can also go to the individual meetings. It's generally a, a public participation section, uh, which also is provided in that, in that environment. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions from the commissioner this evening? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you again very much to all of our panelists tonight for coming and spending Thursday evening with the City of Hartford's Charter Revision Commission. We really appreciate it. And I know the, the public does as well because we've got a lot of folks that tune into these um, while we're live and, uh, and afterwards on Facebook and on public access. So thank you um, from all of us here. And um, briefly before we adjourn, we do have a quorum now, so I wanted to entertain a motion for the approval of minutes from the August 5th meeting. So move. Second. The motion can properly made and second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it, and the motion carries. And without objection, we will stand adjourned at 824. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the presentation.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank luck, guys. everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for that presentation. Great presentation.